with, without uh, any further ado, I, I want to bring Scott, you want to come up? Come on, let's give him a big uh, heritage welcome this morning. And uh, Scott uh, has uh, been here. Scott has been with us uh, a few times now, and uh, he uh, travels all over the world. I'll let him share a little bit about that if he pleases, but uh, I just feel a real strong presence of the Holy Spirit here this morning, so I, I want to just turn it right over to Scott. So, you all have your receiving caps on? Yeah? Let me hear you say amen to that. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Praise God. It's so good to be back with you today. And I give honor to Pastor Jim and Shar and thank the Lord for you and for your family. And all of you, I am grateful to be in the presence of the Lord with you and in your presence. And I not only honor the pastor and his wife, but I honor you as well. And I don't take it lightly to stand in the presence of such a beautiful people as yourself. You are His, and you're the apple of His eye. He, he can't get His mind off of you. In fact, the psalmist says that His thoughts of you are more than the sand of the sea in number. He's, and He's tender over you. He says his, his mercies are tender over all of His works, and you and I are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And that's how He knows you. He, he knows you. He cannot know you outside of where He created you. He created you in Christ. Amen? So He knows you in Christ Jesus. And uh, He sees you as Himself. Praise God. And that's a, it's an awesome thought to know that He looks at you and He sees you through Himself. And uh, He... Uh, he can't deny you. If He denied you, He would have to deny Himself. And you are genetically linked to God. You have His DNA. Amen? You are... Uh, you. He's intermingled Himself. It's a divine intermingling between you and Him. And only He could do that. And, and uh, so praise God, and He has done it. And now, beloved, we are the sons of God. It may not appear what we shall be, but we know when He shall appear, we should be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And as He is, so are we in this world. Praise God. Hallelujah. So, again, an honor to be with you and thankful for you. And uh, Pastor just uh, mentioned about traveling. I, I uh, traveled for many, many years and have... Uh, Ministered in different parts of the world, in um, Haiti, in Africa, in South Africa, and northern Nigeria. Northern Nigeria is an Islamic zoned area of Nigeria. That's the, uh, I'll tell you how I actually went there. It's a real brief testimony, but if you, I don't know that I've ever mentioned it here before, but. Uh, one day I was praying, and as I'm praying, I'm caught up in the Spirit. I'm not aware of my physical surroundings, but I am walking in a vision in what I believe to be Africa at the time, and it was a, just red dirt, and we were walking into a... I was walking with a man I didn't know, and uh, so we walked into this little house, and it was full of people, and the women were cooking in a big bowl or a big pan, you know, they're cooking at the end of the house. And when I uh, closed the door behind me, there's a young man in a vision, or a young man standing behind the door, and he had cuts on his face like this. And I saw him so well, and just, I was there. And I put my hands on him and began to minister to him. As soon as I was done, the Lord, the vision ended, and I'm on my face praying at what I believe to be in an African dialect. There's some other tongues, and... And the Lord uh, speaks to me and says, you will be going to Africa. So I shared with the church uh, a couple of nights later, I said, I had a vision and God said, I'll be going to Africa. Don't know how, don't know when, but I saw a young man there. If I ever see his face, I'll recognize him. Well, I just returned from a trip up in the northeastern part of New Jersey. And when I 
got back home, I'm going through my mail three weeks later, and I look through my mail, and here's a letter from Nigeria, West Africa. And I open the letter, and it's dated July the 1st, 1988. Um, and I begin to read, he said, I've been fasting and praying for 21 days. God said, your heart has been prepared to extend the ministry to northern Nigeria. We've had 30 Muslims convert in the past two weeks. God said you would help. I did not know how he got my name. Did not know anything, but he had a picture paper clipped to the letter, and it was the young man that I saw in the vision. So it's very supernatural, to say the least. And uh, so... Of course, I'm very curious, how did he get my name and where this happened? Later, I found out that I'd wrote a newsletter, and somehow it ended up in Nigeria. <laughs> but I just sent it out to a few people in the States. But anyway, it ended up there, and that's how he got my name. But uh, nine months later, me and three others went to northern Nigeria. We would went to an area where we found out while we were there, they had been killing all missionaries that had come there. They didn't know any that had escaped, and most had never seen uh, anyone of the color of my skin. And uh, some had saw them passing, you know, when they were in another city, but most didn't. And, uh, make a long story short, we were uh, detained, and they took our passports away for a week. And uh, we were 75 miles from the nearest phone, and we had to make a trip without our passports, which you don't never want to do in another country. And uh, so we went there to call the U.S. Embassy and couldn't get through. So we went back, and uh, after a week or so, the, a doctor in town told them, quit harassing these men and give them back their passports. The police officer that detained us, he uh, and arrested the pastor, actually, he um, uh, later became a uh, gave his heart to the Lord and became part of the church. So we built a building there that would seat 2,000 people. And uh, we had, they estimated that in a uh, a week at the soccer stadium, that about 35,000 people attended. Over 4,500, they said, had came to the Lord. Over 2,800, I think, testified to being healed of the power of God while the word was being preached. And uh, so God did many wonderful things and uh, there and uh, I stayed in contact with him for many years and supported the work, but I, I'm assuming they killed him. He just disappeared all of a sudden. But that's, uh, that northern Nigeria is a very extreme area of, the, of West Africa. Praise God. Um, anyway, that's, that was a, a while back, but the uh, the latest uh, long missionary trip was in the Philippines, and last September I was there at the same time, and uh, ministered to about a hundred pastors. There had many miracles. Um, two people who had never spoken in their life because they couldn't hear, the Lord opened their hearing and they could speak and and hear, and. Uh, one man of 17 year kidney ailment, the Lord healed a number of miracles. Uh, one real quick, uh, as a ministering, there was a man sitting at a table because they had tables for it because they were also eating after the meeting. And uh, one man was sitting at the table and went to him and, and I looked at him and said, Something's wrong with you. I said, You're in an accident. He said, No. And I, I said, Yes, there's something wrong with you. You were in an accident. And he said, no, like that. And then this woman sitting beside him said, he can't even hardly walk. So I grabbed him by the hand and said, come here with me. And he's pulling himself like this. And maybe went about 10 feet and he starts walking normal. Praise God. Come to find out he was only there to pick up somebody, one of the pastors, as his, as her driver. So... And they just got in there, and the Lord healed him. But one service on a Sunday morning, everyone who came forward, I don't know of any that didn't receive an instant miracle. Eyes clearing up, ears unstopping. Just It, was, it wasn't like that every service, but the one Sunday morning, it was like that. But the last Sunday morning, it was there. 
Praise God. So I do have a new appreciation in the heart for the Philippines. Also going to Mexico and to and uh, South America, Central America, and, and travel a lot in Canada, northern Canada, the, the First Nations people, and also in the cities. So that's a lot of what to do, as well as going to uh, 45, 45 of the 50 U.S. states, and still got five that I need to go to, but hasn't happened yet. But uh, anyway, praise God. Thank you for... Uh, Having me today and appreciate you, and uh, and I'm blessed to be in your presence. Um, go to uh, this morning to Ruth chapter one. And so I'm going to give you a brief overview of the book of Ruth. And uh, I'll probably, because of time, I'll only read just maybe five, five verses, maybe a little more. But is that all right? Everybody good, happy, blessed. The Lord is with you. Amen. God is for you who can be against you. And He's equipping you and and uh, Christ in you is the hope of glory. So I'm just telling you things you already know. Um, but reminding you, and like Peter said, I'll not be negligent to remind you and stir you up uh, in the things of present truth, even though you know them. And then be established in present truth. I'm still going to stir you up. <laughs> Because you know, sometimes you just got to keep speaking it, Amen. We and speak to ourselves. In the, I rehearse the Word of God daily to me. I need to hear it as much as anybody. Praise the Lord. In Ruth chapter one, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man from Bethlehem and Judah with his wife. And two sons went to reside in the land of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the name of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. They entered the land of Moab and settled there. Then Naomi's husband Elimelech died, and she was left with her two sons who took Moabite women as their wives, one named Orpal, the other named Ruth. They had lived in Moab about ten years. Both Malon and Chilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and without her husband. Now, many of you have already uh, been through this book or you've read it, but um, I want to draw out some things I think is real important and that will be relevant to our lives. It's, this happened, uh, the setting is in the days when the judges ruled. Um, the era of the book of Judges was when everybody did that which was right in their own eyes. And as a result of everybody doing that which was right in their own eyes, they would begin to descend. They would become dysfunctional. There was no order to their life. They, they anything went, so to speak. So what God would do in His love and His mercy for His people is He'd raise up a judge. Samson was one of those judges. Gideon was a judge. Deborah was a judge. And there were others that God would send there. And they were much like an apostolic ministry today that would come in and bring order out of chaos. True apostolic ministry that we could come in and just say... Uh, you know, you, you can't live by impulse. You can't live by emotion. There has to be some order into your life because order is your protection. Order is God's love for you. Order is not so He can just control you and dominate you. He don't need to do that. He's Lord of lords and King of kings. He don't have to, he don't have to convince you of His authority. He just imparts authority to us. And the way He gets you to do His will, He breathes it into you. He said He'll write a new law into your heart and into your mind. So that he doesn't, 
he doesn't even really, and this is uh, difficult sometimes for people to hear, he's not so much about your obedience as he is awakening you to your union with him. Obedience always demands two wills. Union is one will. So his his desire is that you marry his will, that your will be married to his will, and you just do what you see the Father do, just like Jesus, because Jesus understood his union with the Father. It wasn't about an obedience or disobedient issue. Hello? Praise the Lord. So the era of the book of Judges was when everybody done that which was right in their own eyes. Now, there's different characters here in the book of Ruth. Uh, one is Elimelech, we just read, which means God is my king. Uh, Naomi, uh, name means pleasant. And Malon and Chilion means sick and piney. So here's Pleasant and God is my king had two sons named Sick and Tiny. Figure that one out. Then uh, Ruth, name means beautiful or good to look upon. And Orpah, or modern terminology, Oprah, means to turn back. So you're getting the picture. And then there is a kinsman redeemer that we find in this book also, whose name is Boaz. And Boaz's name means a man of wealth, a man of strength. And uh, then you have a, another uh, child that comes later whose name is Obed, and Obed's name means a servant. So you can you get the, the picture. So here, here it is, here's what happened. They were in Bethlehem, Judah. Bethlehem means the house of bread. Judah means the house of praise. So here they were in a place of the Word and the Spirit. They were in the house of the, of the Word and the house of praise. But in the house of the Word and the house of praise, there is a famine. It's not going all that good for them right now. It's a difficult time. It's a time to where it, it, uh, it makes people anxious and worried and, and, the, and they're looking for answers. So uh, Elimelech somehow uh, got this good idea. Let's just go over to Moab for a little while. They didn't plan on living there. It, uh, the King James says they just were going to sojourn there, meaning they were just going to pull alongside the road for a little while until the famine ended. They did not plan on staying there. But Moab, which is the incestuous relationship with Lot and his daughters, that's how Moab came out of that, uh, out of that relationship. Uh, and Moab, according to Jeremiah chapter 48, says Moab is, is at ease from his youth. Me, meaning Moab's been lazy his whole life. Moab is lazy. Moab does not want to change. Moab refuses to be emptied, wants to be settled on its, on its lease, and just uh, and it says Moab is, stinks. Moab is lazy, stinks, and refuses to change. And so Elimelech and Naomi with their two sons decide, let's go over to Moab. And Moab had all kinds of occultic practices. Moab worshipped all kinds of gods, including the Moloch God. They, they, Moab was a bad place. It was not any place like Bethlehem, Judah. But apparently they heard something. There must be some food over there or whatever. So they ended up in the land of laziness. It did not take long in the land of laziness that Elimelech died. Malon and Chilion married Moabite girls. Ruth and Orpah. And now Malon and Chilion die. And Naomi, pleasant, has now her two daughter-in-laws and she tells them, well, let's say it another way, kind of make it, look, you know, maybe where we figure it out. She heard, somebody called her on the telephone, okay, and told her there's a revival 
going on in Bethlehem, Judah right now. God has visited His people once again. There's no more famine. Things are actually happening again in Bethlehem, Judah. And Naomi said, I'm going home. I've been here for ten years. I am going home. I've been tried. I'm bitter. I've lost my husband. I've lost my children. And so she tells Ruth and, and, and Orpah, she said, I'm going home. Your place is here in Moab. But my place is in Bethlehem, Judah. That's where I belong. I'm going back to the place I was meant to be. This land of laziness and no change has brought me nothing but death. So she said, I'm going home. And you go back. And a little convincing. Both of them said, no, we're going to go with you. And after a little bit of persuasion, no, you need to go on back. Or Paul says, okay, I'll see you later. I'm going back home. I'm going back to my land. But Ruth said, I'm not leaving you. Your God will be my God. Where you land, I'm going to land. I'm going to stick right beside you. I'm going to hold on tight. And you're not going to get rid of me. One would leave and the other would cleave. But Ruth stuck to Naomi like glue. And she said, and whatever she said, Ruth would do. So then they get to Bethlehem, Judah, and she's down at the grocery store, all right? She's at the market. And where we can identify a little bit. So she's down in the market, and all these people look at her and say, Is this Naomi? Are, is this pleasant? Are you back? They didn't hardly recognize her. That's what Moab does. Didn't hardly recognize her. Where's the joy you once had, Naomi? Where's that sweetness you always had? You had so much life before. And she said, don't call me pleasant anymore. Call me bitter. Mara. Because the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. I've lost my husband. I've lost my sons. My life is no more. But thank God for His redemption. For His restoration. Because even though Naomi didn't think she had much of a life, God still had a plan for Naomi. God still had a purpose for Naomi. God still had vision for Naomi, even though Naomi didn't have vision for herself. So you can take heart. If that, if that speaks to you today, you can take heart that He, no matter how bad my situation may be, no matter how painful my situation may be, God still has a purpose that only He can do. So, Ruth says, I, I need to go work. I want to go work in the field. We need, we need provision. And Naomi said, You know, give, give permission to Ruth. And Ruth uh, goes out looking for work. And she lands upon a certain... It just happens... Just, you get that? Just happens to come up on a field. Aren't you glad for just happenings? Just happen. Just, just happen to come upon a field that was owned by a certain man named Boaz. A man of life, a man of honor, a man of integrity, a man, a man of strength, a very wealthy man, a man who knew God, a man who would follow the word of God, and, and, and a man who was content in Bethlehem, Judah, and known in Bethlehem, Judah. So she goes into this field, and it's during Passover. They're bar during barley harvest. She actually goes from Passover, Pentecost, Feast, and Tabernacles throughout the whole book. She goes from the, her beginnings unto full maturity. That's a, 
another little side thought in the book. So let me move on because that's a whole book that I, that I just thought to the Lord that this is where I need to go this morning. Praise God. Amen. Let everybody just raise your hand. Give the Lord some glory. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Bless your name. Amen. So now you have uh, Boaz just looking around. He said, who's this girl? He said, oh, that's the Moabite. She came with your relative, Naomi. And he said, her, he said, he told all of his young men, he said, don't touch her. Don't violate her in any way. And he also went further and he said, uh, you uh, make sure she stays with the young women and learns from them. And just, but watch over her. And he told his young man, he said, and, you know, if she just happens to step another field, maybe take something that she that wouldn't ordinarily be given. He said, just go ahead and give her handfuls on purpose. Just go ahead and give her more. Let her have favor. He said, I've already heard about her. I've heard about what happened in Moab. He said, I, and I can't redeem her. Because somebody else would have rights to redeem her. But just take care of her. Make sure she's provided for. And so she, when she goes home to Naomi and she's got food. And she's had a really good day. She's worked hard. She's been disciplined. She's followed, she's followed the heart of Boaz. She, she uh, had integrity. She didn't violate anything. She just worked hard and, did, and went beyond her job. To go the extra mile. Boaz said, whatever she wants, just make sure she gets it. And she tells Naomi, she said, she comes home with food. Naomi says, where did you go today? I met a man, Boaz. And Naomi gets some praise in her. She hadn't had a lot to praise about, but a praise came up in her. She remembered her roots. Amen. All of a sudden, thank you, Jesus. That, that type of praise. Thank you, God. The Lord has had favor on us. You happen to get in Boaz's field. He's the one. He's the one who has an answer for you. He's the one that can redeem you. She said, "I got. I got to teach you some things about the Holy Ghost. I got to teach you some things about uh, about Pentecost. I got to teach you about how to approach Him. I got to teach you some things you didn't learn it in Moab, honey." You're going to look, but this is what's taught to us. This is how I grew up. I can teach you about God. Even though you don't know anything about God, only thing you know is you found something in me that you didn't have in Moab. So I'm going to teach you how to approach Him. So, of course, I'm leaving a whole lot out here. Um, but she said to him, she said, or she said to her, she said, I understand Boaz is going to be winnowing barley uh, like tonight in its threshing floor. She said, here's what I want you to do. She said, while he is asleep, I want you to go in where he's sleeping at. And I want you to lay at his feet until he wakes. And she gave him she gave her specific instructions. She said, first thing is wash yourself. Can I say it another way? Go ahead and bathe yourself in the word. Go ahead and meditate in the word. Go ahead and let the word wash you. And clean you up. Go ahead and let the word. Take, take a bath. Wash yourself. And then she said anoint yourself. Go ahead and pray in the Holy Ghost. Make it where we live. Right? Go ahead and pray in the Spirit. Go ahead and praise. Go ahead and give thanks. Before you ever go make yourself known to Boaz. And you go lay at his feet. Find a place of rest at his feet. Don't go in making yourself known. Don't go to Boaz telling him all the things you need. Wash yourself. Anoint yourself. Lay at his feet and rest. 
until he notices you. I think there's a really important lesson there. That so often in our preparation to come to our Boaz, because Boaz is obviously a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we approach our Boaz to be able to go in and say, I just want to lay at your feet, Lord. I'm not coming to make my need known. Your words cleanse me. Your spirit anoints me. I just want to lay at your feet. And then, well, when Boaz woke up, he was startled. I think it's I think it can startle the Lord when we just come to him and just say, I don't want anything right now. I just want to sit at your feet. I'm not asking for anything. I just want to sit at your feet all night if it takes. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna lay right here until you awake. And Boaz said, uh, I don't don't let anybody know you're here. But I'm going to try to redeem you. But there's somebody first has a right to you. If they can't redeem you, I'm going to redeem you. I am going to purchase you back from the Moabitess uh, life that you've lived. And I'm going to follow the Word and, and bring you to myself if I can. But there's somebody nearer than I that first has the opportunity to redeem you. If they can't, I will. It's a beautiful book, isn't it? And so, now you, uh, Boaz uh, gets a hold of the nearer, nearer kinsman that has the right, according to the Levitical law, to redeem her during this time. And he considering it, and then he's, uh, Boaz says, well, there's one thing here. She's a Moabite. He said, I can't do it. I cannot redeem her. So they go with the ten elders. Oh, there's so much here. So much revelation in this that we could just keep going on and on. So the ten elders, and he said, and they have to confirm this that now Boaz has a right to redeem Ruth. So the nearer kinsman takes off his shoe, which means take off all property rights. You have no more property rights to her. Now she belongs to me. The nearer kinsman, by the way, represents the law. Ten elders represent the Ten Commandments. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sent His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Amen? So the near kinsman was the law. The law could not redeem you. The law had no answer for you. The law was to point you to your Redeemer. The law was to let you know you needed somebody to redeem you. But Boaz now is your Redeemer. And, but not only that, but the law could not redeem you. And the law had to take off shoes. <laughs> Meaning the law of Moses has no more property rights on you. For you're not under the law, but under grace. Amen? You're not under the law, but under grace. Jesus said, I give you a new commandment. Amen? I give you a new commandment. On this, hang all the law and the prophets. Because Jesus came and fulfilled the law. And now we are saved by grace through faith that not of ourselves it is the gift of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. So now Boaz, and here's, here's the beauty of redemption. 
Because everything, now Boaz was a man of wealth. Boaz was a man who was feared respectfully. Boaz was a man of honor. Boaz was a man of integrity. Uh, Boaz was a man who uh, owned much of the fields and the land and, and was known as a fair and a righteous and a just and a just man. And everything, and please get this part, everything that Boaz was, Ruth now is. That means everything that belongs to Boaz belongs to Ruth. That Ruth's identity is no more a Moabite. Ruth's identity is now the wife of Boaz. Amen. Everything that Boaz is, Ruth is now. Somebody can go ahead and, you can go ahead and shout if you will. Because your, your identity is not in Moab, the land of laziness that never changes. Your identity is in Boaz. Your identity and your place is in Bethlehem, Judah. House of bread and the house of praise. The Word and the Spirit. So now Boaz and Ruth are married and Ruth conceives and has a baby. And the baby's name is Obed. And Obed's name means a servant. And the, guess who? Naomi takes, Bo, takes Obed into her arms and takes Obed and nurses Obed. And Obed restores Naomi back to life. Did you, did you get that? Naomi, who was bitter, who was Naomi, who was uh, lost her husband, her two sons, spent ten years in the land of laziness, brings Ruth with her, and now Ruth meets Boaz, and they have a baby. And when they have the baby, the nurse of Obed is Naomi. And the scripture said, and Obed restored Naomi to life. God's perfect plan of redemption. And that which is that which has been used, everything there's again so much here, but that which has brought you to the place, there's a re, there's a restoration today of Naomi. That which has been bitter is becoming pleasant again. Hallelujah. That which is that which has been given up on. It's not that she didn't have any life. The best she could do is at least introduce Ruth to Boaz. But now God took that union to restore. Is I said another way to restore a sleeping church back to himself? That a church would actually take a servant ministry that would come from union with Boaz and Ruth and bring a people back to life again. That a real restoration would start to take place within the body of Christ and the people of God would begin to stand up in a way that they haven't for generations. That people would rise up in the understanding that their kinsman, Redeemer, I know my Redeemer lives. Amen. I know my Redeemer lives. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And understanding the full light of that redemption. For the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing and everlasting joy upon their heads. Blessed be the name of the Lord who's restored us back to life. That brought us back that there's been a union between Boaz and Ruth. And now we're not, we're not going to live in a land of laziness, nor are we going to live with the influence and the effects of the land of laziness. No more Moab who refuses to be empty. I should say one more thing about Moab. Because God said, I've got, a, I've got something for Moab. I've got a plan for Moab. You know what my plan is? I'm going to send 
tilters in. That's what the old word is. I'm going to send. I'm going to send in people who are going to overchange, overturn their tables. I'm going to break all their bottles. I'm going to bring an end to that whole system of Moab. They may not, Moab says I'm not going to change, but Moab has an appointment that they don't know about. That land of laziness has an appointment. And I'm talking beyond people. I'm talking about a mentality, a mindset, a lifestyle. He said, I, I got some tilters I'm going to send right into the land of Moab. They're going to come in. They're going to tilt the tables, turn them over, and they're going to break down all of their old bottles. And, and it's not going to be the way that it's always been. That land of laziness I'm dealing with. Praise the Lord. Um, California. <laughs> that which is said, I refuse to change. God is, is doing it. I, I, I mentioned to Pastor before the, the service this morning that I have a, uh, 11 years ago, is all right if I, I just go ahead. Uh, um, 11 years ago, July 16, 2012, I received two prophetic words, and, which I wrote down, and uh, I want to. I want to read those to you. That's all right. Praise the Lord. So it, isn't this book of Ruth just such a beautiful book? Book is such a great book of redemption. Uh, if I taught it right, I'd take eight hours to teach it. So I've left a whole lot out. But at least you've got the, the overview of it, right? Uh, this is the first part of it. But it kind of goes along with what I'm talking about now. There will come a mighty move of the Holy Spirit that will sweep away the refuge of lies and bring a release of the power of God that will change the course of history. Before this happens, there will come change in the church, especially in the West. There will be a wind that will come from the East and it will come with a mighty force. Within this wind will come great persecution from unexpected places. Remember, this is 11 years ago. People, uh, unexpected places and people, and there will be an alluring of the principalities that have dominated the world and deceived the church. God is going to lure them in. Hosea 2 and 14 said, I'll, I will lure her into the wilderness and speak comfortably with her. Share one quick thing about this. One Wednesday night, the Lord gave me a prophecy and said, I'm going to lure the enemy in before you, and I'm going to slay him before you all. That following Sunday night, I was preaching, and a man came in who I didn't know, stared at me the entire time I was preaching. And afterwards, I said, Lord, do you want me to minister to him? And the Lord said, go ahead. He didn't tell me what was here and come. And uh, so I said, uh, do you know Jesus will make you free tonight? And he mumbled something. I couldn't hear what he said. I said, do you know Jesus will make you free tonight? And he, this voice came out of him and says, you can't handle me. And he comes at me and tries to kill me. Uh, growling, spitting, biting, any way to, to, to you know, him grab the hold of me. And uh, anyway, make a long story short, he said he didn't remember any of that. He said, the only thing I remember is a light came out of the sky and hit me in the head and went through me. He later became part of the church. And uh, God delivered him. Hallelujah. Amen. Um, but the Lord said, I'll alert him. What's happening now is he's alluring. He's, let, he's going ahead. Just go ahead and show yourself. I'm slaying you. So he said, I'm going to lure the principalities that have dominated. I have to move quicker. Dominate the world and deceive the church. Where there has been the invasion of New Age occult teaching, there will be a purging first within the body of Christ. And then there will be great deliverance that shall come from the throne of praise 
There will be multitudes of media materials and philosophies of men that will be burned and discarded. There will be great edifices where people have worshipped with a veil over their face that will be abandoned and and walked away from. I will change the face of my own, says the Lord, and the world will not recognize her from her past. For those who have been given the secrets of the kingdom and responded to the joyful sound of liberation, your revelation shall be matched by your demonstration. There will be those who in chains will come to you to be set free, but many will seek to do you harm. But my power shall rise up within you to defeat the aggressors, and you will not gather as you once did for your own pleasure, nor will you be fighting with your sword as you now do, for you shall know that it is really me, and apart from me you can do nothing. Many in this day will stand in shock and disillusionment as their ministries and kingdoms crumble before their eyes. Those who have ruled as princes shall find themselves serving, and those who have been at the bottom will be at the top, for I will bring a shaking in the earth that will shift the axis and create what has not been seen for many generations. There will come in this time a coming together of my people who leave the old camps of idolatry and return to me with all their heart. Yet some will say, we never left you. But they'll discover the error of their own ways, and my mercy will prevail over the old ancient idols that have defiled the sanctuary of my people. They shall be returning to me and to my voice, not to the voice of the accuser or the old law, nor to the voice of the deceiver who says all is well, peace, party, and play. I will move in a way that I will surely be sanctified before my whole house, and the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of the Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign. That's the first part of it. Is that all right? So here's the, the second part. I'm coming in a way that I was not expected. And the wise among you will not recognize the form in which I will appear. There are those who have faithfully kept my word and walked in purity of heart that I will reveal myself in and they shall come out of nowhere with fire in their bones. They shall speak truth that shall pull back the deceitfulness of men's hearts and I will be glorified, says the Lord. Speak out against the corruption in high places, but speak as one with a voice of mercy for those who have been held captive by her shame. There will be those whose foundation will be shook as they wonder and question, why did not the Lord protect it? And there will be those who have blessed me for their prosperity, who will curse me because of the anguish of their soul, but I will remain faithful. There are those who have trusted in the sight of their eyes and have looked to their political and religious leaders to deliver them and to give them answers. But the day will come when men will once again break down those images and come to me with a pure heart, for I alone am the one to deliver. I've been waiting in line. I've been on the outside of my own house. My spirit grieves while my wife dances with demons. That is, this is the hour I will appear to bring her to my heart and rescue her from her deception. And all will know that you are mine, says the Lord. Many have cried unto me as they have been buried in information. But those who don't know me, even my own, have been wrapped in the grave clothes of ancient spirits who have placed themselves in authority over nations and kingdom and peoples. They have controlled the nations that men have bowed down to and trusted in their strength rather than in mine. But I am God, and I will show myself strong. There will be a shaking in the high places of government. That which has been called free will no longer be called free. But my people will shine bright in strength. They shall do great wonders and miracles. Those who have trusted in their own riches and the riches of others will be disappointed in the God of mammon. There will come in this day men who have longed to be wealthy, who shall abandon their wealth and walk away from it in disgust, shaking their hands, saying, We will have it no more. I will remove the sorcery from the land. And those who have used it to rule the world, there will be those who will bring their drugs and their incantations 
in large numbers. They shall come into the streets of their cities and burn them in large piles as they celebrate my liberty that I have given them. Can you say amen? There will be those who have judged and stood as a God who will be humbled before all. This is not a day to hold men's person in admiration, lest you be deceived. But when I appear, I will be the admiration that cannot be turned away from. For I am the only true God, and my love shall shine brightly throughout the land. There will be those in large number who will gather in the stadiums to watch their teams, and I will show up among them that the game cannot continue. For my wind will appear in places where I am not welcome. I will not ask for permission to do these things, for even in the colleges and universities, I will expose the lie as my people shake off the filthy garments that have been placed upon them in my name. The world and its current control will not stand in this day, even as I purify the soul of my church. The ancient work and the religious order will crumble as men cry out with great pain as their gods are gone, and what they had given and pledged their life for is now forever disappeared. This is not a time to look to the arm of flesh to deliver you, nor is it a time for you to look to your images and old traditions to support you. This is my time. Can you say it's his time? This is my time, he said. And it's high time to awake from the present order of things. For my wind shall separate the wheat from the chaff, precious from the vile, and the vanity of men will fade as my beauty does appear within you. This is a day to rejoice for you that have waited for truth to appear. And have not and could not find a way out of your bondage. This is a day to be glad for those who have been overcome with sadness and disappointment because of the injustice done by others. This is your time to stand up and proclaim with a loud voice, our God reigns. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah to the... Amen. Amen. Can you stand to your feet? Just give the Lord some praise because... what. For me, and, and while it came through me, it's just, it speaks so loudly to me. And uh, 11 years ago, it didn't mean even what it does today, because we're surrounded by it. But, but, but in the midst of it all, darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise on thee, and His glory shall be seen on thee. Nations will come to your light to the brightness of your eyes. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Father, thank you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for being glorified. Be glorified, O oh Lord. Be glorified in us. Be glorified, God. Yes. Hallelujah. Glorified, hallelujah. Be glorified. Go ahead. Be glorified. Be glorified. Be glorified in this temple. Hallelujah. Seeing that, I just, that just resounding within me, I just have to live it out. Be glorified. Be glorified. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you for our Boaz. 
Thank you for our heavenly Boaz, a man of strength and wealth and character. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you for this inheritance. Thank you for your redemption. Makes us an heir of you and a joint heir with Christ. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you for restoring us from Mara to Pleasant. Thank you for giving us life again. Hallelujah. Thank you for visiting Bethlehem, Judah. Thank you for bringing your people to an awakening, to an awareness again of who you are and and your purpose and your work in our lives. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Couple right here on the front. Would you hold out your hands, both of you? As I'm, I'm seeing the Lord coming and filling your hands, and filling them with provision. Your assignment's not done yet, and. Your assignment of what's in your heart that God put in your heart isn't done yet. The the needs of others, the ministering to the needs of others, the helping of the hurting, the sending portions to those whom nothing is prepared. And I see the Lord just coming, just filling your hands, releasing a releasing an anointing and a strength in your hands that you'll be able to accomplish this that is before you. Because he's, he's, not, uh, he's not done with this, this work in your life yet. It's still an assignment to you. And he's, he's birthing it in you. It's just, it's, it's been conceived in your heart and, and I see the Lord beginning to come and, and visit you in, in dreams and... and uh, and just putting this desire that where this desire within you is just going to become so strong. Even over the next two or three months, you're going to just feel this desire in us has grown so much. And, and then you're going to see God fill your hands. Your hands are not going to be empty. But plenty, plenty to do what you need to do. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Father. So I enjoyed the, the praise and worship team this morning. Just it's beautiful in the flow. And I'm, um, I know the building is not the size you had the other place, but I like it better. <laughs> I just, it, I just believe that. And when I pulled up, something leaked inside of me, and I just said, "This is God. This is God, because this is where things are going to be fulfilled. This is where the dream." And so you, and and I declare, you'll just have favor in everything you ask for. You've got handfuls on purpose. Things that need to be moved will be moved so that you can have the favor that you need. So you, you, you move out and favor it will find you at every turn, every place of decision. But this is where you're going to see many prophecies that's been spoken over you fulfilled. It's like the prophetic's been on hold in some areas. Some things have not been fulfilled because they couldn't be fulfilled yet. But now it's been now you're in a place. You're in the place of fulfillment where his hand shall fulfill what his mouth has spoken. You're at that place. Amen. Um, a brother here that played the guitar this morning done such wonderful uh ministry on the guitar. Uh, there's a greater desire in you to to know the Lord, a greater desire to be used by the Lord. I see the Lord anointing your fingers while you play. Uh, and 
healings taking place while you're playing. That people being released, liberated. You're gonna you're gonna play things you've never played before. It's, you're gonna you're gonna find that's just gonna that's gonna be a heavenly sound that's gonna come from the guitar. It's more than just your your knowledge and you know how to play. You're skillful in what you do, but you're gonna come to a place you haven't come before. And you're gonna just you're gonna move out and you're gonna you're gonna hit chords and notes, stuff that you haven't never done before. You're gonna make sounds you never knew that could even come out of there. Because the Lord's gonna prophetically causing your guitar to sing. And so it's not just the guitar, it's not just that you have skill, that but it's a prophetic sound that's gonna release captives. And uh, there's a deep cry in your heart, um, and it, and uh, I, I see the Lord just lifting a, a lifting a mindset, a, a, a way of thinking that what still press you and push you down, something you fought with, and and. I see the Lord just anointing your head with oil and taking the harassment. It's the harassment of the enemy upon you. It doesn't relate to who you now are. But the Spirit of the Lord is is touching you in a new way. And it's going to be a fresh sound of your life. A new song the Lord gives you. And the new song is not just a literal song, but it's a song of life. It's a new song of liberty. It's a new song of joy. And you you're not going to judge yourself harshly. Praise God. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Um, my brother here on the end by the worship leader, your husband. Yeah. Um, You're going, you're going to find a greater contentment in the Lord, a contentment in in uh, what you do, contentment in, a, put another way, a greater fulfillment, fulfillment financially, fulfillment in your career, purpose. And this has been an area where the, the enemy's been able to defeat your thinking. And you've, you've had to walk under a, a, a cloud. And it, you were surrounded by a cloud of negativity. You've had to push through it your whole life. But uh, that, that cloud, I just see the Holy Spirit just blowing upon that cloud, and that cloud beginning to disappear. And you're starting to find a new place and that you're going to find that negativity is going to be swallowed up. It's not that you've given in to it. You've tried to fight against it. But it's still been there like a cloud. You understand what I'm saying? Then, But the Spirit of God's breathing upon you fresh and new. And that old cloud of negativity is going to vanish away. And then as it does, you're going to look through. You're going to look up into the heavens and you're going to begin to see a new, a new purpose. You're going to get ideals you never... And you've got them already inside of you, but you're gonna, they're going to really start to register in your mind because you, you, you have an ability. There's a creativity in you, and so much of it's untapped. But by the name of the Lord, we call it forth. Hallelujah. And you're going you're gonna to get, you're going to prosper in ways you've never been able to prosper. There's some things that there's just some things that you've desired that you can see any way you could ever do it. And you feel guilty at times. And, and, and that's where the, a lot of the battle, but you're going to let go of all of that because you're coming through it. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Give Him some praise. So worthy. Lord, you're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your grace.
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. Um, Brother Wright here on the end. Yes. Um, I don't know anything about your crystal. I just... I see the things changing in your life. They've already begun. Uh, even this year, things started have started to turn in your life, and and it's a in some ways it's been a an insecure time because there's, there's new things, there's old things that are passing, and new things that are beginning, and you haven't been able to grasp. Grab hold of the new things just yet, but the, but the Lord is uh, He's not forsaken you. He's not turned His back on you, nor has He denied your your cry. He's heard you, and He's He's uh, bringing you to a new place in your life, uh, to uh, letting the past go, just letting it go, not trying to. Hold on to it, not trying to fix it. Just release it. Because as you do, you're going to begin to embrace your future. You're going to embrace what God's got for you. And uh, the the past would uh, kind of be like a... It have a right now, the past has a lot of loud voices. So you, you just keep going forward. To what God's got for you, and those voices will go away. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Amen. A sister right here on the back. Back here. <laughs> so, can you stand up? Can you? Is it difficult for you? If you can, without hurting yourself, the power of God's going through you right now. From the top of your head to the soles of your feet. Healing flowing in your body. In Jesus' name, right now. Right now, right where you are. And not not only that oppression coming off, it's coming off of your soul as well. And uh, you're going to find yourself, you're going to start feeling better. You're just going to start to notice that I feel better. I can do some things I couldn't do. Because uh, I'm going to, I'm, I see you being able to, there's just some things that you enjoy. And you know what, this is really fulfillment for me. It's where I get a lot of joy from. And you're going to be able to do some things like that again. I can see even do, doing some things with your hands or maybe you know, you're going to find a new a new joy coming back to you. Restoration of life or you, Neil. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Um, sister right here is, uh, is there a black? Yes. Um, wow, just, I'm just sensing the, the love of the Lord over you. And God's God's great love for you. I know you do. And and his love for your family. And and his love is going through you right now. And 
what I'm seeing him doing because of his, his pouring out his love on you is he's bringing you to a greater place of peace inside. And it's giving, it's giving you a victory. And a lot of people may not know this, but you, you have a sensitivity to him that you know things sometimes before they happen. You know things that are going on that you may not say anything. You, nobody may know, but you know. You can see things. You have you have a discernment in you. Uh, the Lord is also he's he's coming into your life and and he's going to find that you're um, that you're going to hear things from the Lord that's going to start to confirm things in your heart that you know. And it's going to give you confidence. Because that's what that's been the cry of your heart is that confidence. And he's giving it to you. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, Pastor Jim, I'm seeing uh, See you um, uh, being interviewed, and uh, may not be even what you would want to be interviewed, or even who you would want to be interviewed. But I see it being interviewed, and I see it uh, getting attention. God's going to put you in in uh, greater places with a greater platform a place where your voice can be heard because it's the voice of the Lord. And uh, he's setting it up that it's going to be something that's going to happen that's going to bring you to, to, to national attention. And it and you don't have to fear it. You're, uh, but you're going to be able to speak into areas where you've not been able to speak in before. Praise God. Amen. This is the this is your time of fulfillment. Uh, Ruth, you're good to look upon. Ruth, you're beautiful. Amen. I want to call you call you Ruth because you are married to Boaz. Hallelujah. You have his name, his inheritance, his favor. You're a very powerful people. Praise God. The, a man of wealth and strength has been given unto us, Amen. our kinsman redeemer. Thank you, Father. The law couldn't redeem us, but He is our redeemer. And we know our redeemer lives. Thank you, Father. Amen. Lord bless you and Pastor God bless you. Thank you again for having me.